Uh, all right, so now we're going to talk about the DOM, or the Document Object Model, D-O-M. DOM is the data structure that web pages use. It's how you can manipulate all of the elements in a page with JavaScript. So the DOM is basically a big tree. So HTML, when you write HTML, you're, you're writing a tree structure. So a tree has a root. So the root element is like this HTML tag, right? And everything inside of that HTML is uh, our children of that root. And then everything inside of those children are our children, and so on. So we can say that HTML has two children, head and body. Uh, head has one child, title. And inside of title, there's some text. So when you write HTML, you're dealing with these kind of nested hierarchies. So you're dealing with children and parents. And like body has these two children, h1 and div. And div has a child span and some text. So we're thinking in trees already when we write HTML. And in the DOM, uh, we basically make these a little more explicit. So, so the first thing to note is that there's this object available in the browser called document. So if I go into a web page and go into the debugger, I can type document. And it's an object. It's already been defined for us by the browser. And there are two things here. So in our HTML here, we've got head and body. So we can do document.head, and that's the head element. If you click the head element, hel head element in the debugger, you'll see that it has a title. And if we do document.body, we can see that the body element has all of these children. So these are just two things that are built into the browser that you kind of get by default. So um, the other thing to notice is that these tags, these HTML tags, the angle brackets, are often called elements. And elements can have parents and children. And in JavaScript, how you access that is dot child nodes uh, for an array of the children and dot parent node for the parent element. So for example, um, if I have document dot body, uh, I can do dot child nodes and I get this array. So there's some text in there. There's a h1. And so if I do element one, that's going to be that that h1 tag, this is very tree. And then I can do child nodes on that, and I get some text, because um, HTML is made up of text nodes and element nodes. Um, if you do dot children, which I didn't put in the notes, then you actually only get the HTML nodes. So sometimes that's more useful. And then parent node. So for every one of these elements, I can call dot parent node. And that gives me a reference to what its parent is. So if I have an element that's attached to the DOM, I can always refer to the parent, and the parent of the parent, and the parent of the parent, all the way up until you get to the container element. So I can keep doing this, get HTML, but the parent of HTML is, I think it, yeah, so it's the document, and then it's just null, because there's no more parents. Um, so uh, we can do some things, like we can do head, the children. So it's kind of what I was showing you a moment ago. So parent node and child node is the important stuff here. So this is, uh, we don't really write web pages like this, right, where we're accessing the child nodes directly and like doing child node again, like child nodes of three dot child nodes zero, right? This, this is very verbose, um, right? So we can use this thing called document.querySelector to uh, provide some little short circuits. So document.querySelector uses the CSS selector engine. So if you've ever written any CSS, you can use all of that knowledge to write query selectors. So for instance, if we want to get at this span element, uh, it's the only span element in the entire page. So I can do span and I will get that element. If there are multiple elements uh, in a page, so if I had multiple spans, I would only get the first element. And there's there's a neat little thing to uh, fetch all the elements that I'll talk about in just a moment. But so
So uh, with query selectors, we can do all kinds of things. So if we look at the HTML again, um, there's this thing that's a class, right? So there's special syntax with dot to fetch classes. So if I do document that query selector dot msg, I'll get that div, right? Because dot is for classes. Uh, if you have IDs, you can use the, the pound sign or the hash. So hash uh, top gives me the h1 element at the top. You can also um, just refer to elements by uh, their element name. So h1 will give me the same element. And you can actually uh, stack them. So if I want to get the h1 called top, if something else had id top, that wouldn't match because all of the constraints have to be true. Um, so here, here's kind of the, the list of things you can do. You element names, class names, you can fetch things by IDs. Uh, attributes are really handy too. So if you have like a text box in this page, so if I just go and edit this page and put a text box in it, um, like input type equals text, value equals cool. Maybe I have another text box, value equals um, great or wizards. Okay. So if I refresh, uh, now I can do query selector for input. Maybe there's uh, multiple kinds of input, right? Maybe we have a submit for our type or type password. Value equals secret. Okay. So if I refresh, if I do document that query selector input, uh, I'm going to get the first match, which is the type password, but maybe I want uh, type equals text, right? So you can put that with square brackets into your query selector, and I'll get out the first element that matches, which is put type text equals the first one, value cool, but then maybe I want the second one, right? So I could do value equals wizards to refer to that. Um, so this is sometimes handy. Uh, you also don't have to put the element name. It defaults to any element, so it's the same as you could put a star or you could just leave that off entirely. Um, you can read all about CSS selectors on this W3 article that I'll put in the lecture notes after. Um, so importantly, we talked a little bit about this during the HTML lecture uh, last week, but you can combine CSS selectors like this. So all of these constraints are true for a single element. So this has to be an element that's named h1, it has to have an ID of cool, and it has to have a class name of row, and it has to have an attribute of five. So this text, like this h1 tag will match. But if any one of those elements is not, is not uh, matched, like if we change the ID from cool to sweet, then it won't match. Whoa. Um, yep. And also, uh, query selectors reflect the sort of nested structure of the DOM. So if we have a class and we want to search everything within, like within the children and the descendants of that element, then you can use a space to separate that. So um, if we have .msg uh, from our text, so .msg will match this div. And if we do space span, We'll fetch, we'll, we'll basically only search things that are descendants of div, so only this text, and then we'll pull out a span from that. So if we put something like hash top space span, that wouldn't match anything because top doesn't have any spans underneath it. Whoa. Okay, so we've seen query selector. This returns the first matching element, but there's this other handy thing called query selector all, and that returns an array. So if I do document.query selector all, uh, well, if I just do query selector input, which you saw previously, hang on, whoa, too much. Let me move that down a little bit. Okay, there we go. Okay, so if I do document.query selector input, uh, I just get a single input element, but if I do document at query selector all, I will get an array. So I get all three inputs. And uh, like if I want to get every element on the page, I could just do star. That will return every single element. Um, fun stuff. So what's really cool is 
that once you have an uh, element reference, so once I save, like, um, like let's say I get just the first div, so document .query selector div. Once I have that reference, so here's the div that's like msg. Uh, just like you can do document .query selector, you can also do query selector on any elements. So if you want to pull out the spans underneath the div, you just do query selector span. And, or input, right? Input type equals text. You can also do that. So um, there are also some other things in the DOM. Um, you know, you can just use whatever you like. There's get element by ID that's only for uh, getting elements by an ID, as you might expect. Get element by ID of top will give us h1 top, but or element get elements by class name is similar for classes. Uh, I I personally prefer to just use document query selector everywhere because it's it's perfectly adequate and it does it does like everything that these functions can do. So uh, so once we have an element reference, what can we do with it? Well, um, we can do things like we can set the content inside of the tag. Either we can set the text, and, or we can set the HTML content directly, and I'll explain what the difference is in a bit. We can add and remove children. Uh, we can set and, remo set and remove attributes, like those are the, uh, the little strings, like type equals text, or value equals whatever in your HTML. So how do we set some text? Well, once we have an, a reference, which you can get with document.querySelector, uh, you can just do dot text content equals and then the string. So uh, the nice thing about setting a text content is that you can have like you can have characters in it. You can have like less than and greater than, and those will not be interpreted as HTML. Those will be interpreted as literals. Like so, if you get some input from like a form or something, and you want to display it with JavaScript, this is a good thing to use because you don't have to worry about like somebody putting a less than script, greater than alert hello into your box and making your day not fun. So how do we do that? So I'll just get a reference to that div again. Document query selector div. Div dot inner HTML or sorry, I haven't talked about that. Div dot text content equals cool. So this will replace everything that is in there currently with the string cool. Whoops. Oh get element. Right, I'm going to do query selector. Thank you. Query selector div. Div dot text content equals cool. Text content equals. So all of that, all of those children went away. So if I look in the elements, I can see that now div doesn't have any children, only this string of text that says cool. So that's text content. Uh, you can also set the inner HTML. So sometimes you have like a block of HTML that you want to set, you can do that with dot inner HTML. HTML is all caps. So div dot inner HTML equals wow. And now there's some bold text in there that says wow. Cool. Um, so so far we've we've mostly just been constructed we've been kind of pulling out elements from the HTML as the that have already been set up, but you can create elements too with this thing called document.createElement. So if we want to make an element, you can just do document.createElement, and then you give it the name of the tag that you want to create, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Like you could set some inner HTML with some more tags, uh, you can do text, whatever. So document.createElement, and I'll make like a element. I'll make uh, an input box, right? Well, maybe not an input box, but uh, maybe I'll make an H1. So let's do create element with H1. Um, so now I have an H1. It's not actually attached to anything, so I could do I could set text content. Great. So you'll see that the page isn't updating. That's because it's not attached to the DOM. So to attach that H1 to the DOM, we can use this method called the pen child. So with the pen child, you can insert children. So uh, if I want to insert that to something that exists on the page already, like uh, 
I can do like document that body, data pen child h1, or if I have another reference like a div, I can call a pen child on that. So if I do this, see the message, great. We could also create multiple uh, nested children. Like we could make a div and then make a, a bold tag, a b tag, and then we could set some content on the b tag and append that to the DOM. So if you like copy paste this block of code, whoa, oh crap. Sorry about that. Okay, so if I copy paste this block of code and do it carefully this time. So this uh, had a div that got inserted, and then we put some text inside of that as well, I think. Yep. Cool. Anyways, a uh, pen child is how you insert notes. So you can also remove children. So if I, I still have a reference to that h1, so if I want to get rid of it, uh, I can, I know that it's attached to the body, so I could do document.body.removeChild which would work. Or, I can remember from earlier that uh, there's this thing called parent <coughs> node. So a nifty little trick to remove an element is just to use uh, the parent node yeah. dot remove child, and then the ch child element. So now that element has disappeared. We still have a reference to it though, but it's just not attached to the DOM. So if we want to put it back, we could just uh, put it back, either in the same place or somewhere else. There we go, it's back in the DOM. Notice that it's always at the bottom, though, because we're using this method, the pen child. Um, there's another method that I'll, that I'll get into in just a bit about how you can insert things at arbitrary spots. But that's remove child. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but first, um, there's this method called set attribute. Set attribute lets you change um, attributes, which are like input type equals text, input value equals whatever, those are attributes. Uh, you can either insert new ones or change existing ones. So this code, um, yeah, I can just type this out. So I can make a new element. Why don't I just refresh everything? Kill all of this code. Okay, there we go. So I can make a new element. Uh, create element input. Now I can do input.set attribute uh, type input that set attribute value cool beans. Now if I insert that into the DOM, document.body.appendChild input, we get a text box that has uh, type equals text and value cool beans. Great. You can also remove elements by doing uh, dot rem remove attribute. So if I want to remove the value attribute, I can just do remove attribute value, the value goes away. Um, works just like you might expect. So, but getting back to the problem of, um, okay, so we've seen a pen child that can insert things at the end, but what if we want to insert stuff like in the middle or at the beginning? You can use this method called insert before to do that. So. Suppose we have this list, right? It goes 0, 1, 3, but we want to insert something in the middle that says 2. So um, let's just make a file for that, list.html. Okay, so here's our HTML, and we want to insert something in the middle of that. Okay, great. So what we can do so what we can do is uh, we can make a new element first using document.create element, and we can make an li that's a list item. Now we can do uh, two.set attribute class two, um, just to match what's already there because each of these has a class. And now, so the next part for doing an insert is to find the element that we, we want to insert something before it. So in this case, we want to insert 2 right before 3, so that 2 comes before 3. 
So we can get we can get a reference with query selector to three because it just has a handy class name of three. Mm -hmm. So we can do dot three. Now um, we've got to get a handle on the parent node ul, but luckily we can just do three dot parent node, and we can do insert before. So the parent node is the the ul tag, right? Yep. So we can do three dot parent node dot insert before. The, the node that we want to insert, which is two, and then the node to insert it before, which is three, and if we do that, we get zero, one, blank, three. Mm. That's because I forgot to set the text content. So if I set that text content, we get something actually. Make it whatever we want. There we go. Cool. Zero, one, two, three. Perfect. That's insert before. So, uh, some other properties that elements have on the DOM. One of them is called style. Style is really fun. So if we take that handle of like two that we already have. We can do dot style and style lets you update the CSS on the fly for any element. So if I want to set the color of that, I don't have to go into some style sheets. I can just say color purple. Now the color is purple. Or I could set the, I can make it bold by doing font weight. So, uh, you know how in CSS a lot of the properties have dashes between them? So when you use style, you actually have to camel case it. So if I want to set the font dash weight, I do font capital W weight, and then I can set it to be bold, for example. There we go. And the same goes for like font size and all of the rest of that stuff. So font size equals 72. Great. That's style. Style is fun. Um, event. So, questions so far? I'm, I've been going pretty fast, but yeah. So is that actually changing the HTML or is it changing the CSS? It's uh, changing the computed CSS, kind of like per element. So, um, if I refresh the page, it'll all be the same, of course, but the HTML actually doesn't update as far as the browser is concerned. I guess it does. So, what actually happens is it updates kind of the inline style property. Uh, so, in your HTML, you can actually put a style on an element. But when you access dot style, you're doing the same thing. So. Right, of course. <laughs> uh, you had an attribute a few examples before that says x equals y. Yeah. Is that just a random attribute? Yeah, that's a random attribute. So if you have a, an attribute that doesn't, that the browser doesn't know what it should do with that, it just will ignore it. So you can put at whatever attributes you want, pretty much. Can you just Yes, you can access any attribute that's been set. So if I put like two dot set attribute, whatever, six, six, six. <laughs> um, if I look in the HTML, then whatever equals six, six, six. So I could do query selectors for that, like query selector, um, any element, it's like whatever, or any element where whatever equals six, six, six. string when you use numbers, but there we go. Can you store anything in there? Any uh, strings. You any can store strings. So if you want, if you really want to, this is a bad idea, but you could uh, set attribute with like json.stringify of some object and then you can parse it out again. Don't do that, but you can do that mm -hmm. if you want to. Who am I to say don't do that actually? Okay, so that's good. So now, Events. So Johnny talked a little bit about events with the, the intro node stuff. So browsers have events as well. They're a little bit different in the DOM. Instead of doing dot on, you do this ugly looking thing, dot ev add event listener. But uh, so if we have like a button, for example. So I'll just uh, add a button to our wow example. So if I go back. Uh, so now if I make a button. Um, button, uh, I could give it an ID or not, and it's like, click me, slash button. There's also input type equals button, but button is a little nicer because you can put uh, like italics or bold, you can put whatever HTML you want in there. So I like button. You refresh, click me in bold, cool. So if I click it, nothing happens. That's because I haven't registered a listener. So <coughs> to do that, I can make a script, right? 
Um, I'll just do this inline, but it's usually a good idea to, to do this with another file. Uh, but just for purposes, I can do document query selector button. That'll give me the button reference. So now I can do button dot add event listener. Click. And then I give it a function, like a callback. So uh, there's actually an event parameter. You can look at that, or if you don't care, it doesn't matter. And um, so we can do something. What should we do? Let's make a message. So let's just make a, like, a div and stick it on the page when we click the button. That'll be fun. So we can use document.create element to do that. Make a div, set the text content to something. Maybe the current date would be cool as an ISO string, because ISO strings are great. And then document.body.appends child div, right? So now when we click the button, this function will fire. The browser will call this function for us. And our code will create a div, we'll put some text in it with the date, and we'll put our div that we just created into the DOM on the body tag. If I refresh, and I click it, then I get the date. Yay. And as many times as I click it, I'll keep getting dates. Cool. <laughs> Great, so these are events, and I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, for forms. So pretty much uh, any elements that you can see, you can add a click event for. There's also events uh, like mouse over, mouse out. So if you move the mouse over something, you can cause an event to happen. Uh, these are all kind of just built into the browser. So the browser is always firing these events, but you might not be listening to any of them, so nothing happens. There are also a bunch of default events that happen, which I'll talk about. So um, if you have a form, for example, there's a default event that fires, and that's to send an HTTP request that like, basically you like send a post or a get, and you navigate away from the current page. But, oh yeah, question. Can you add the uh, set events on a, an array? Query select all, and then you want to add a click to all. Oh, if you want to add it, uh, I can show you how to do that real okay, fast. Yeah. Okay, so realize. if we have buttons, okay, so if we have, yeah, sure, if I have a few um, elements, so let's get rid of this stuff real fast. So if I want to set an event on all of these so that I can click it, so what I can do is I can just um, Make an array so I can document that query selector all for ULLI. So that's like, sorry, query selector all. So everything under UL that's an LI. Then I can just loop over those elements. I plus plus. So it does get slightly tricky here uh, because of scoping. So this is something that bites beginners a lot. And even experienced programmers, like I, I occasionally do this by accident. So if I just do add event listener, click, and I expect LMs of I to be the same in this callback, that's not necessarily true because this for loop ran and I was incremented every single time. So by the time that anyone can click this, can click the button, Continue. I is going to be the last element, yep. always. So instead what you have to do is use closures and uh, so we can make a little inline expression where we'll have like the element reference. <coughs> so if you do that, now you can refer to LM and LM is going to be uh, consistent because it creates a new scope on the fly. So if that doesn't make too much sense, you can just copy paste it. And But what's going on here is, um, yeah, question. Uh, this Right, so this is going to be the same as the element, if that matters. So sometimes you'll have like document query selector or something. You have some expression right, right here, and so you don't have a variable for it. You can use this to refer to the element that matched. But in this case, I'll finish this example. So um, when we register a click handler, now we can do, uh, maybe we'll set its style to be bold font weight equals bold. That'll be a cool example, I think. So now when we click one of those elements, set it to bold. So one, two, three. Ah. We could also do 
this style.com weight equals full because those are the same. So, see that tied in what Johnny had to say a little bit? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, but getting back to this form example, so what if we want to submit a form? Uh, why don't I just make a form really quick? So, get rid of this. Um, so, forms look like this slash form. Um, you oftentimes have like type equals text in there, and usually you give them names. So, name equals cool. Um, and then maybe we'll have a second text box, or maybe not. So, but we can have a submit button that doesn't require a name. You can say value. Submit this form. Okay, so this is what a form looks like. And then oftentimes you'll have action equals post or get. The default is action equals get, which is kind of puts a, you know, if you've ever seen a question mark in a URL with like a bunch of garbage after it, that's a get. That's like a query string kind of action. Not necessarily from a form, but that's how it works. So if we have an action equals post and a method, or sorry, method equals post, and action equals the URL, so like submit, um, then, then the browser, when we click submit, will actually send an HTTP request to slash submit. Okay, so, but what if we want to do something a little bit fancier because we have JavaScript? Well, what we can do is first get a handle on the form element, so we can just query selector all for form, or query selector for form rather. Now we can listen on the submit event, which all forms will give when you click submit or hit enter from a text box. And so if we just listen for the event, then the default action will still happen, which is to navigate away. Uh, to a different page, like slash submit, which doesn't make any sense because I'm not even running a web server. So that's not good. How do we fix this? Well, what you can do is remember how we get this argument, the event. So what we can do is call event dot prevent default. If you do that, now when I click submit, uh, I get a message. And the def we've prevented that default action, which is to navigate away from the page and send the send the HTTP request. Uh, if we want to get at the form elements, we can use like a form dot query selector maybe for a name equals cool, right? And we can do whatever we want with that custom. So console.log cool. Oh, sorry. Uh, we've actually got to do dot value. I forget that part all the time that tells you what someone typed in the box. There we go. Yeah. Cool. So you can make your custom forms. Um, I'll show you something at the end of the talk that's uh, sending an HTTP request with this approach called XHR, XML HTTP request. It just lets you issue HTTP requests from JavaScript instead of relying on like page navigation to do that. Um, so that's forms. And prevent default. Oh, I guess it's the next section. So. Mm -hmm. Um, questions so far about things? Okay. So browsers have this nifty little API called X -H sorry, XML HTTP request. So hard to say. And it's kind of ugly. You have to listen for this. The reason is uh, XML HTTP request started out as an ActiveX plugin that was only available in Internet Explorer, but it became quite popular. And so other browsers like uh, Netscape which turned into Firefox and Opera, I guess, implemented uh, this functionality with a constructor instead of a weird ActiveX thing. And so you do XML HTTP request, even though for the most part this has nothing to do with XML, it's just might as well be called HTTP request, but it's not called that for, for silly reasons. And then you have to listen to this ready state change, and there's a bunch of ready states that happen like when the server initially connects and when there's a new chunk of data. But for means when everything is finished, then you can do xhr.response text to get the text of the body of the HTTP request or response. 
So we can like send a post with some parameters, and this will like send a post so I can whip up pretty quickly this example. Um, I'll need to run a server, so if I do static dot on port 8000, now I'm running a server. Um, actually, it's doing posts, so why don't I quickly whip up a little HTTP server to handle our posts? Because I forgot to do this part ahead of time. So you get to watch me create one. So create server, rec res. And now uh, I want static, so I'm going to install static. And so static we can use to, to serve up static files. Name for that. So if rec.method is a post, then um, I'll just print, I'll just uh, I'll pipe the request to standard out. Otherwise, I'll make ecstatic handle that because I don't care. Okay, cool. So this will let us have a little bit of HTML and we can just print out what the post would have been and it'll actually just, I'll just print a message. That should work. Cool. So and I've got to listen on port. Okay, so that's listening on port 8000. It's ready to go. So now if I get back to the code, uh, if I make a little index.html, so now if I paste that, well, if I paste that code from a moment ago, we'll put this in a script tag, with slash body, and do body, okay, so, and script. So this code is going to issue a post request to that um, route when we load the page. And then it will print the response text. So if I load localhost 8000, I should. Body equals OK. Cool. Ignore that message. It's fine. So we got back the message that our server sent. And what did the server see? It saw our post parameters right there. Um, so cool. This is how you can send HTTP requests from the browser. This is just with the native DOM, but actually the native DOM, like this is kind of really, this is really hard to remember. I had to stuff up to write this code. So writing this code this way is not great, but there are libraries, like uh, it's really common to use jQuery for this, but I personally like to use smaller abstractions. Like there's this package on NPM called XHR um, that you can use to so with XHR, you can just require an XHR. You can send some parameters like method post URI slash. This is pretty much the same example, but I can remember what the parameters are. So if we put that in our code, um, the thing is you'll have to use browser 5 if you want to use this approach or something like it. But so we can make, we can make a browser.js file, um, put in that XHR code where we require the module. And then with Browserify, you can do Browserify browser.js to make a bundle.js. There's also a command, uh, Watchify, that you can run that will keep writing to bundle.js as we modify files. Whoops, 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 whoops. Hang on. Oh, right, I forgot to pass it a file. So if you invoke Watchify, now if we modify our file, we can like keep working on it and save it, and it will just recompile automatically. So you don't have to keep remembering to run that command. It's kind of handy. Okay, but anyways, once we've done this stuff, now if I reload the page, it does the same thing. Body equals okay. I don't even get that nasty error message from whatever that even was. I don't I have no idea, because that API is really ugly. Um, What's cool is there are a lot of tiny abstractions on NPM for dealing with stuff like class lists. So if you want to like toggle whether a class is, is uh, in your HTML elements, you can use this package class list for that. Um, there's stuff for XHR, there's stuff for WebSockets. All of these little tiny abstractions that you can put in your code without copy pasting from some obscure Stack Overflow post. Um, you just NPM install and then run some scripts and handles it for you. So uh, there's a nice thing that Browserify can do too. Uh, if we don't like hand packing the post parameters, uh, you can use this module called query string. 
So if I do, well, like QS equals required query string, right? Now I can give that an object. So I can do qs.stringify foo bar x5, which is the same as that like hand hacked thing. But if we have stuff like spaces or extra funky characters, it will escape those for us automatically, which is quite nice. Yeah. Um, so if I rerun browserify, it should just you know boringly be the same, and it is cool. And meanwhile, we've been getting all of these requests. That's pretty much all I have to show. So if there's any questions, um, you can raise your hands. Or you can come talk to me afterward. So hopefully that gives you a nice crash course and done. But yeah, Marina. Uh, I have questions about like XHR. Like how are you, well, I'm having a hard time seeing how you would use that to be an example. OK, yes. So you would use XHR if you want to uh, keep your page going. If you want to talk to the server without reloading the page. So one example, like my blog has this, for example. Uh, if you load my blog, you can just click something. And then without reloading, you get the article because it's doing XHR requests. Then at the bottom, there's a little load more button that loads more. So you, like Twitter has an interface like this where it just kind of like keeps the page so you don't lose your place lose the context, you don't lose stuff that you've typed in already. You can interact with the server without reloading stuff. So that would be an example. And uh, WebSockets kind of fit into the same category, but they're more for uh, real-time communication. They require a little more setup server-side, but um, XHR is for ordinary HTTP requests.